Today is the last part of my conversation with Greg. We've been celebrating 30 years of marriage in these episodes entitled For Better or For Worse. In part one, we shared about our story and some of the best and worst times we've experienced as a couple. Last week, we talked about parenting, and today we wrap up by sharing honestly about the joys and challenges of life in ministry. Hi, friend. You're listening to Find Hope Here. I'm your host, Teresa Whiting, author, speaker, ministry leader, friend, and fellow struggler. This is a podcast about the messy, complicated, painful parts of life, but also the beautiful, joy-filled hope that Jesus promises. Each week, we dig deep into God's Word together and talk about how His truth impacts our everyday lives. I'm not going to ask you to sit with me and have coffee because I seem to have my best conversations while I'm just doing life. So I'd love to hang out with you as you walk or fold laundry or drive to work. You're invited to join me in pursuing the hope God promises. No matter where you are or where you've been, I pray you always find hope here. Let's jump in to today's episode. All right. So as we're talking about ministry, let's kind of move into the ministry section of our discussion um, because you have been a pastor for the whole 30 years that we've been married and ministry brings with it its own set of blessings and challenges. So um, let's first talk about some of the blessings of being a ministry family. Because there are a lot of blessings. Yeah, I I mean I I loved um, being with our children in in ministry because there were um, you know opportunities to be around other people. They could learn, uh, you know, to serve other people. We go over to other people's homes, you know, and uh, just kind of re- remind them, you know, of opportunities they have to serve and to be able to be a blessing to other people that, uh, that we serve, you know, they were able to be involved in different things we did at church. And if we were doing something at church, uh, with the church, then they were there, you know, and helping and serving, uh, those kinds of things. We got to, uh, take some trips together, you know, got to enjoy family together. Um, do I get to talk about our timeshare thing? This is the timeshare story. So, uh, so we were on, you and I were on a getaway and we had our first timeshare experience where, and we learned our lesson later that we could have asked for a lot more, but I think they gave us free restaurant. Oh, it was this horrible (laughs) restaurant. It was so not worth it. Yeah. Free meals at this restaurant. So, so then we, I think in those days it was a 60 minute presentation, I believe now it's 90 minute at least. But we're sitting in this timeshare and they're explaining, you know, all the details and we're telling them about our situation. And basically what I heard them saying was, if you love your kids, you're going to get a timeshare because all these great places they get to go and all the things they get to see and the vacations you get to take. If you love your kids, you're going to take them there. And and that really made me upset. (laughs) And they also said... If you don't get a timeshare, your kids are not going to get to go anywhere or right. do anything. Right, right. And yet we got to travel. We got to, to yes, we didn't stay in hotels or do all those fancy things, but we got to be with family. We got to go different places uh, because we're a pastor's family. We sometimes got to go and stay for free in different places. We got to see a lot of things and have a lot of fun. And so it was very frustrating to hear that. But the truth was, um, that was a blessing in ministry to be able to enjoy those things. Um, even some things we couldn't afford, but we still got to, to enjoy them. Yeah. And I'd love to go back and find that lady because our kids have been to more continents and more countries. They've done missions trips. They've done travel on their own. I mean, I just kind of want to be like, excuse me. We did travel. I'm sure that line worked on a lot of people and they don't care about us because we were never going to buy a timeshare. Okay. All right. Um, to me, I have other time share stories that I know we don't have time to tell. I know you could tell, we could do a whole episode on the trouble of timeshares. 
Like, like the time we went for our anniversary. Oh, you have to tell that story. That's this is a this is a marriage story. Just you got to <laughs> tell that one, Caesar. Dedicate this right. portion of the episode to Caesar. <laughs> so this is our twenty fifth anniversary in Mexico. Well, can I tell the other part too? That was a problem. Sure. All right, so we're staying at this all inclusive resort, right? So that's that means they have everything, and so we're on the beach, and they come and say what what food do you want? And I'm, I'm in Mexico and I'm a big chips and queso guy and salsa guy. So I see the picture and I say, I'd like chips and salsa, right? That's what I asked for. Um, we don't have salsa. What do you mean you don't have salsa? This is Mexico. We don't have salsa. I, I pointed at the picture. The picture was of salsa, right? Yes. <laughs> I want, I want that. They had what do you call um, it? Pico. It was pico. pico. Big not, chunks of tomato. Same thing. Delicious. Same thing. So good. No, no. So no, no salsa. No, no queso. No queso. In Mexico. Okay, it, moving on. Sense. Moving on. Greg talks about this like once a week. Okay. All right. <laughs> so then so then uh, time. Oh, well, the reason we got this great deal to be there at this resort is because we had to take a timeshare thing. So this was, wasn't it on our anniversary, our actual it anniversary? It was on our actual anniversary. So Bad on our decision. anniversary, we, we already knew how much I hate timeshare presentations. So I'm ready though. I know how this thing goes. The people who talk to us beforehand, okay, how long is it going to be? 90 minutes. Like 90 American minutes. <laughs> this is just 90 minutes, 90 minutes. So so they take us, we we get this free meal, right? Uh, which is good, always good free meal. And then we met our representative for the day, Caesar. Um, talk to him about the 90 minute thing at the beginning as well. So go through this thing. And if you've been on these, you know, you see these beautiful, this beautiful resort. And of course, we're not staying at the, we don't get to stay at the actual resort that they're showing us, selling us. But we go to this resort, they show us around. And then at the end, you go into this room where you're sitting with your guy, Caesar, and everybody else is in there. And this is the big selling point. And so they try to convince you that you need to buy a timeshare. Well, Caesar was going on for a while. And, and we had told him, no, we told him, listen, we did this for the free trip or the it, almost free, but it, it was, was a great yeah, deal. Great, great deal. And, and we're not buying uh, I'm a ministry. We don't have the money. Um, our, 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 Vacation budget is a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. So oh, what what timeshare can we buy for a hundred dollars a month? It didn't seem to be any. Uh I realized we're getting near the end of this 90 minutes. And so I simply pulled out my phone from my pocket, saw how much time was left, and put it on the table. Uh Caesar was not happy with that. <laughs> We were not his best friends anymore. At that and point. Yes, we were best friends until then. That led to other issues after that. But I uh, all to say that I hate timeshare presentations. Yes. And then we spent like that afternoon, we're walking on the beach and he's like, lies, lies, it's all lies. And I'm like, Greg, we know what they do. Like, let's just enjoy our free-ish vacation. I know, but add up the chips and salsa thing in Mexico and... Caesar, and then walking in the hot sand, I had a blister on my foot. Happy anniversary. Okay, okay. Moving on. That was such a digression from the topic at hand, which was the blessings of being in ministry. Um, I, I, I'll i tell a story of, not, not a story, but some of the blessings for me, I think is God's provision as a ministry family we could write a book on God's provision. We have been given, like given, handed the keys to over 10 vehicles. And not just, not all of them were clunkers. I mean, a lot of them were nice vehicles that people just gave us. Like, you're a pastor, you need a car. Here, here's the keys. What in the world? Um, clothes, vacation homes. Um, what else? This, yeah, lots of gifts. You know, gifts at Christmas or gifts at other time. Hey, you're going, I know you're going on vacation. Here's some money to do something special with your family. Things yeah. like that. It has been, I mean, just the generosity of God and his people has just blown us away. And yes. that to me is just such a 
blessing of being a ministry family. Um, and then obviously like seeing lives change, like to get to witness people whose lives are impacted by the gospel and they change. Um, and then also sometimes, you know, you're just planting seeds. And one thing that was kind of cool is a couple of weekends ago, I was at a wedding back home and I saw a couple who had been to a church where Greg was the pastor 18, 20 years ago. It's, I don't know how long ago. It was a long time ago. And, um, you know, it's an amazing couple people. We, we didn't know, I guess the impact, but they like stopped me and intentionally talked about the fact that, um, that ministry had such an impact on their lives. And it was kind of a reminder to me, like, we don't know the lives that have been impacted through ministry that we've done. And so that's, that was really exciting for them to say, like, Greg discipled us more than anyone else we've ever met from that time forward. And we mentioned this briefly, but like some of the things we did together as a ministry family, what are some of those things that you remember? Hmm. What were the things? I think of small groups. You know, that was a big family thing. Yeah. We uh, started small groups in every church we were in. And that was a highlight for our kids. Like our kids loved small group night when their friends would come over we would have time with the adults. The kids would have time together. We'd have mm -hmm. time as families. And that was, I think, a highlight for them, that things that we did as a ministry family. And then something else I'm thinking of is Lighthouse. Yes. Yeah, so this was during the time that we were actually living with your brother and, uh, and the church they were going to, we were going to, had a mission trip that was in Florida and that served families that were going through childhood cancer, right? They were in remission, but it was an opportunity to go and serve those families at a beautiful place in Florida. And so we did that as a family to see our kids serve with us and to serve those families in need uh, was, was an awesome experience. I think that's probably one of my absolute favorite family memories. Like to serve together is one thing, but to watch your kids like come and willingly, excitedly serve other people. It, sometimes I would just sit and watch and just want to cry and be like, this is so beautiful. It was such an amazing thing. And I think they still do it. It's called Lighthouse Family Ministries. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes because it's such an incredible ministry that mm -hmm. you can support, or maybe your family would want to go and do a trip like that someday. With all the blessings, alongside of all the blessings, there were also some real significant challenges as a ministry family. Um, what are some of the challenges that we faced? Well, God moved us a lot. So um, kind of like a missionary family, I feel like, it, you know, when we felt that God was leading us somewhere else, this was a family thing. This was not just me, not just you and I. And in some cases, it was difficult times uh, for them because they were leaving their friends, leaving school in some cases. Um, and uh, so moving was was difficult. And you I mean, you can, you hate it moving. I'll talk about moving a little bit. Um, I remember one move in particular when, when we sat the family down and you told them that we were leaving that church. I went to bed that night and I could hear every single one of my kids like weeping from their rooms. That was probably the worst memory that I have of a move they were all so devastated that we were leaving and i and i don't like moving i i hate moving actually um and we've moved a lot so i definitely would agree i would echo that 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 was probably one of the hardest things yeah and and then also there were some churches where as they got older they were hearing some things and seeing some of the difficult parts of ministry where people were complaining or being upset about things that were connected to me typically since I was a pastor and and to know that they had to hear and experience some of that was really difficult too. There have been times when I have said to you, why are we still in ministry? Like, let's just be done with this and let's take the target off your back. For some reason, people think as soon as you 
take the title pastor. Like they can say whatever they want to you <laughs> and they can criticize you and you're supposed to be perfect and you're not. And um, sometimes people's expectations are just crazy. So we're just being really honest here about yeah. the ministry. With, with that, I should say though, that that one of the things we tried to do when we first went to a church, one of the things I needed to do with the search committees was two things. One is to say, you know, you're not on staff. Right. You're you're planning to be a regular part of the church, just like any other person would be. Um, and then secondly, the children um, needed to be treated, you know, like other children that, that, that they didn't, there was no, the pastor kid type of, thing of these expectations uh was not okay to do that and i think in most cases our churches responded really well yeah, to that i would agree i would agree i i don't think we we tried really hard not to make them feel like well you're the pastor's kid so you need to behave a certain way right i really think we tried right. and i think most of our churches really respected that but what was it like for you as a pastor to know that your kids were seeing kind of the underside of ministry, like the, the dark parts and the hard parts. At first it was hard. I remember one business meeting, I think it was Alex and Isabella were sitting in there and, uh, and somebody got up and made this crazy accusation against me that then another guy then stood up and said, that's not true. But still just the fact that they heard that at first it was really hard. And then in some other cases with our kids, but as we then work through that, I, I feel like it was also probably good for them. Uh, try to encourage them. This is what ministry is sometimes like. This is what people are sometimes like. And to try to uh, answer their questions and let them process that. Um, it was not easy, but I think it was something that just they had to go through. Yeah. I think overall, overall, like if if I had to summarize, like, I'm thankful that we were a ministry family, that we yeah. are a ministry oh, yeah. family. I'm yeah. thankful that our kids grew up as pastor's kids. Like I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And so I had such a different experience as a child. You know, I, I got saved in my teens. And, and so for me, like when I got saved, I was hungry. I was so desperate for God's word. Like I wanted, I, I had seen the world and, and didn't, like it. I didn't like what the world offered. And so I was like all in. I feel like our kids didn't have that experience. They they grew up in the church. They grew up hearing the Bible from the time they were born. So I, I don't know that that is a positive or a negative. It's just, that's what it is. And maybe for them, they haven't necessarily seen what this world offers and how it, it's not satisfying and it's, and it's not anything compared to what you have in Christ. So um, I think growing up in a ministry family, that might be a little bit of a challenge, like that you come into the world and you, you have this background. And I feel like as kids, we just think, oh, this is the way everybody does things. But then, you know, as they're all adults now and, and out on their own, they're seeing like, oh, well, this was my family experience. And some of them, I think, see it really positive. Some see it negative. I think they all see both sides, the yeah. good and the bad, yeah. you know? Um, anything else about ministry that you want to mention? Um, overall, I'm very thankful. You know, God called me into ministry when I was very young. And so one of the things I was praying about was that he would bring me a wife that would be a great partner in ministry, which he did. And then children, you know, that would uh, thrive in ministry and and learn and grow from it. And so I, I look at it so far and just feel like it's been really, really hard. But because God has called us to it, it's been a great experience and to bring up our, our family. And like you said, they've got to deal with their own stuff, how they see it and what they're working through now moving forward. But from my perspective, it, it was just a um, wonderful blessing to have a family in ministry together. Yeah. Is there a um, passage of scripture that you think of like that, that has been a source of strength or for, for our family or even a song that like comes to your mind? 
a verse that comes to mind is a verse I share with with people uh, in counseling that I share with people uh, who who need hope or struggling. And it's the verse that came to my mind when you when you ask that question. It's Romans 15, 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And I remember I was going through uh, in ministry, it was one of those times, actually it was the time before we were without our own house, when God brought this phrase to my mind that I have now said hundreds and thousands of times over and over again when I start to struggle. I believe in you, I trust in you, I hope in you. That is saying that to God. And these this verse is just talking about that this God of hope will fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him for this. And so I think of that with our family. I think of that with ministry, uh, that joy and peace is possible even in the midst of really difficult things. But it all has to do with God. And it all has to do with that sure hope in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you aware that that is the verse that I close every podcast episode with? I should be aware because I listen to every podcast. Yes, On I do. On double speed? No, one and a half speed. One and a half. Using my time wisely, I could still understand everything you're saying. That's right. Yes. Good choice. A verse that comes to my mind is Psalm 127, 1, which says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And I think it's been our prayer that God is the one building our house and building our family. And then um, the song that comes to my mind is the Casting Crowns Broken Together. I think that that song has been, it's just been a really beautiful picture of marriage that this is not the fairy tale that we dreamed it would be, but it's reality and we are two broken individuals. And I think it's the chorus that says the only way to last forever is broken together. And I Love those words, and I'll put a link to that song if you haven't heard it. It's so good. Can I add one now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dancing in the Minefields by Andrew Pearson. Oh, yes. That one, too. We'll put that link in the show notes as well. In what ways have you seen growth over the years, either in yourself or in me or as a couple? Like, where have you seen growth? Well, I, I think just, you know, Dealing with my own sinful tendencies on my own is hard enough. You know, I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about anything sinful. And I don't like to, to, you know, to think of my sin or to realize that I still struggle with sin. So to I was definitely a perfectionist growing up and uh, wanted people to think those type of things about me. So I, I'm not there yet, but just growing in being able to be who I am, you know, ha have my own uh, struggles uh, with you, with family. Uh, with me? You have struggles okay. with me? <laughs> I mean, my struggles in front of you, with you, <laughs> to just be who I am. And, you know, so I think that's growth. It, I think that's uh, a lifetime uh, growing. But uh, you know, when you're living life with somebody else in marriage, and then also with with the rest of the family, it's not just about me. So I think growing through learning how to to love and to forgive and to um, and to, you know, live in humility and to laugh at myself. And I mean, those are all things I still need to keep learning to do. But uh, that's a lot of the things God's been working on me yeah. in growth in my family. Yeah. I think you've come a long way as a pastor in being more authentic in front of people from the pulpit, even um, just being more honest about your own struggles and your own life. And I think that's something people relate to you more than maybe they did when you were first a pastor. I think for myself, you know, one of the things that, that I think of, and it, this is really small, but an area of growth is when we were first married, I just so desperately thought you needed to be able to read my mind and I wouldn't talk about things and I wouldn't say things and I would <laughs> just get annoyed or upset or sad. And I finally, after all these years, have learned, I'm still learning to speak 
and be direct. Hey, can you please do this? Can we talk about this? Can we? Um, this is where the pan goes. <laughs> yeah. Again, uh, another area of growth, I would say, is just through the counseling we've done. And I don't think we mentioned that a lot. We talked about the intensive, but over the years, we've done quite a bit of counseling. And one of the last sessions we had recently, the counselor was talking about, it's not necessarily about who's right and who's wrong or doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing, but are we connecting with each other? And that's kind of been a good mindset shift for me of, it's not about like, well, this is the right thing or this is, it's more about, am I connecting with you? Are you connecting with me? How can we enter into each other's lives, which has not been our MO as far as the way we think about when we're in a fight or an argument. Yeah. And a couple of thoughts came to my mind with that. Um, one is just that we've received counsel and that's not something that I would have been open to when I was younger thinking, you know, you only go to counselors if you have problems <laughs> that you want to talk about. <laughs> so, but we've gone to several counselors and, and just um, the willingness. And that's also then helped me to suggest other, you know, guys and other couples, like it's always helpful to be able to talk about it with somebody else who can help you think and work through it. And kind of go back to to uh, another question from earlier about our marriage and sh coming out in the open and sharing things is we have counseled several couples we've counseled several couples that have been in the same situation as us and then when uh, if i'm counseling uh, a woman or a couple then i bring you into that we've done premarital counseling so we've been able to to minister and serve based on our own experiences and challenges um than with other couples to be able to build into them also. Yeah. All right. Before we close up, I would like to tell the listeners a little bit more about you and some of the things you're doing. Obviously, you're a pastor. Tell us where you're a pastor. Tell us about NSD, because I think that's one of the most amazing things you've created. And then also you have a podcast too. So talk about that. Okay. So uh, I'm for a couple months now, been the new lead pastor at Fifth Avenue Baptist Church in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, St. <laughs> Pete, Florida. Near the beach. Thank you, Lord. Which which uh, you are a big beach lover and I'm not, but I love you. And I do like the beach early in the morning and, and in the evening. Those are, That's nice. So yeah, so that's that's what I'm doing. I have a great uh great group of elders to work with, a very diverse congregation in, in every way. And uh, and this is after being an associate pastor, not thinking I was going to be a lead pastor again. And now God uh, bringing us here and looking forward to this being, God willing, along in my last ministry and uh, just excited about it. Um, and the next steps, discipleship is uh, something that came to my mind and heart many years ago of discipleship is really about just taking your next step and helping other people take their next step. And so basically what I've done uh, every couple or few years is a uh, year long, weekly, 90 minute men's intensive discipleship group. And we read 12 books together, one book a month, we memorize 50 verses because uh, we have 50 meetings for the year. Uh, I do some teaching on discipleship, some basics of things for our own spiritual growth and things they can pass on to somebody else. And, uh, and we also give them time to pray with one another, uh, partnership time to encourage and challenge each other. And that's been a, a huge time of growth for me personally. And also for the guys who have done it, and it seems like with their families, there's been an incredible growth there. And uh, so that's something that I want to continue to do, uh, I and think, even make it available to other people. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. I think you need to make this available because it's so instrumental. It develops men in the church. It develops leaders. It develops leaders in the home. The wives have said so many times, like my husband is is different now. He has grown so much. He's a different kind of husband than he was before. And I think um, 
I just think it shouldn't just be at your own church. I think you need to get this spread out to everybody. Okay. And then my podcast, uh, Next Steps Bible Reading Podcast, is just me. Uh, I'm uh, just using a uh, Bible reading schedule, I'm reading two Old Testament chapters, uh, a chapter in, in the Old Testament poetry, and a chapter in the New Testament. But I'm kind of doing it as a devotional time for me. So I'm reading it, and then I am saying, okay, what sticks out to me about applying it and especially applying it in prayer. And then I pray. And the the hope is that the people who listen to the podcast will uh, be able to have their own devotional time. They can follow along as I read, they can read it themselves, and they can be encouraged to think about how are they going to apply that passage of scripture that day and pray about it. And so uh, have it on its next steps Bible reading podcast. I'll, I'll put a link. You'll put a link on it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in closing, what would you say to the listener who just wants to grow and move their marriage to a better place and strengthen it? Yeah, I would say, you know, Romans 15, 13, there's hope uh, because of God. There's hope because of the Holy Spirit. And no matter where you are, what situation you're in, even if you found yourself in the situation I was in personally, uh, you need to talk to somebody. Uh, you need to, to talk to your spouse. You need to talk to a pastor, talk to a counselor, uh, talk to a good friend that can help you. And, and just uh, be willing to, to deal with whatever issues have, have been there in your life, be willing to be completely open and honest, to humble yourself, uh, but to remember that uh, that God intended marriage to be a picture of Christ in the church. And that means that uh, just like the church, we're going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, uh, but there's great hope. And we get to show a picture of what it looks like uh, to have a marriage that is growing and healing and reconciled and is a picture to all of those around us that there's hope because of Christ. So Teresa, anything else that you want to make sure you share on this episode? Um, well, I guess the, the thing I would want to do is just also encourage the listener. Um, so I want to encourage you to keep moving toward your spouse, to fight together the battle that's waged against your marriage. Um, and also hope that there's hope that Whatever situation your marriage is in, I guess that's the last word I'd want to leave with you, that, that there is hope for your marriage to get better. I will have links to all the things that we talked about on the podcast, um, links to our church if you want to come visit, links to Greg's podcast. Um, I hope you'll check all those things out. And in closing, babe, would you um, share our favorite verse? Sure. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.